So this is hell. <laughs> I never have believed it. Do you remember all the stories they told us about the fire in Brimstone and the torture chambers and the burning mall? Old wise tales. There's no need for red-hot pokers. Hell is other people. Today, I'd like to talk about a side quest in the RPG classic Fallout New Vegas, a game that, in my opinion, we could take many lessons from. One such lesson is when we arrive at the settlement of Jacobstown, located in the northwest section of the map. The dryness and indifference of the Mojave Desert replaced with welcoming shades of green and a community housing super mutants. Super mutants and nightkin, more specifically. Both were created in a world which saw them as subhuman. This is what comes from a post-apocalypse that has a crumbling bureaucratic and liberal state in place, and the imminent threat of an outright fascist one dangerously close to taking over. The Nightkin in Jacobstown are addicted to invisibility. They've developed a tolerance to stealth boys, a technology that gives the user the ability to go large periods of time unseen. The Nightkin develop this reliance due to their self-consciousness around others, namely humans. It gets so bad that a lot of them have become schizophrenic, taking on other personalities. Keen, the chief of the Nightkin, is misanthropic to you because he is suspicious of humans and their intentions. He doesn't even want you to look at him. When you choose to end a conversation, he replies with reluctant relief, Finally! Marcus, the head super mutant in Jacobstown, is diplomatic by contrast, easy to talk to. He explains to you that the Nightkin's reliance on stealth boys comes in large part due to their antagonistic relationship with the NCR. The NCR, or New California Republic, is that broken liberal state I just mentioned. It's the closest thing New Vegas has to a governing body. They control most of the land, are well armed, and have no problems imposing their will on other communities. Their ideology is imperialist, but they are losing their facade of power as more and more people in the wasteland are admitting to feeling safer around Caesar's Legion. The Legion is a nationalist group of fascist slavers run by a man who believes himself to be the reincarnation of the Roman Emperor's principles. They really adhere to the bit, going so far as to cosplay like Roman centurions and generals. They look silly, yes, but their violence is brutal, direct, and authoritarian in a way that the NCR simply isn't. In other words, one faction is getting things done, the other talks about getting things done. The NCR runs on false promises to its people, empty rhetoric that hasn't been taken seriously for decades. Neither faction have direct access to wealth because the vast majority of wealth is held by Mr. House on the Vegas Strip a corporate overlord who has no ideology other than the nihilistic belief that money is power. While in town, you meet Lily, a nightkin nearing the end of her life. She's not as self-conscious or hostile towards humans as the other nightkin, but she suffers from dementia, believing you to be her grandson Jimmy and having an alter ego named Leo who is prone to violent thoughts. You can question why Lily listens to Leo, to which she warns you not to in his presence. We can choose to get to know Lily and her backstory. She didn't leave the vault until she was 75, when she was captured and conscripted to be a soldier, occasionally working as an assassin, thus explaining the origin of the unfortunate reliance on stealth boys in order to remain unseeable while doing horrific deeds in service to another. Lily acknowledges that Leo helped her do this. So the dependence on stealth boys in order to make assassination easier created an overwhelming amount of shame and guilt for the Nightkin, who became stealthy assassins at the cost of their own humanity. It's ironic that the Nightkin are synonymous with stealth, since they are hulking figures way taller than the average human. Next, we meet a doctor, the sole human living in Jacobstown. He's trying to find a cure to relieve the mental suffering of the Nightkin. We can ask him what I think is a pretty interesting question and where the rest of this video is leading to. Are humans affected by repeated reliance on stealth boys? He answers that it's possible, the potential is there, but not as much as the Nightkin. And while we don't yet coexist in a world with hulking super mutants, we do live among many groups of people who are looked at and treated as subhuman, as other, like the Nightkin. People of privilege, people like you and me, we're oppressed too, not as bad, 
We're oppressed in more subtle ways, though. Which brings me to the work of Jean-Paul Sartre, one of the 20th century's most privileged and controversial thinkers. In Sartre's play No Exit, three people are destined to spend eternity in hell together. I'm going to spoil an obscure play that is 80 years old, so if you have a problem with that, come at me, I guess. It becomes apparent that their hell is having to deal with each other, not of any medieval torture or endless burning. Although it is initially unclear why they are there, it becomes apparent they were all unfaithful to their partners. Inez shows much disgust towards Garçon because he's a hypocrite. He sees himself as a noble revolutionary who runs a pacifist newspaper, dying honorably by getting shot 12 times because of desertion. But he also cheated on his wife several times, even going so far as to bringing a woman back to his home and having sex in the spare room as his wife makes them coffee. Inez is a cruel manipulator who had an affair with her cousin's wife. He died in an accident, and the wife unalived both herself and Inez by lighting her gas stove as they slept. Estelle is racked with the most amount of guilt. She married a man three times her age, only to fall madly in love with someone younger than her. Even worse, she has a child with the younger man, but chooses to drown the baby in front of him. The lover chooses to end his own life, and Estelle eventually succumbs to pneumonia. The point for Sartre isn't that these are all horrible people who deserve one another. Rather, it's to show how they're all hypocritical in their own way, refusing to look inward, believing themselves to be morally sound. Well, at least Garçon and Estelle do. It's not until they start talking to one another that they begin to open up about who they really are. Inez isn't repulsed by Garçon in any moral sense. She simply sees him as a barrier between herself and Estelle, who she is attracted to. She's resilient to Estelle's rejection of her because she is already so cruel to herself. It's when I can't see myself, I begin to wonder if I really exist. You're lucky. I'm always painfully conscious of myself. In my mind. At first, Garçon sees Hell as an opportunity where he can finally get some good thinking done. He's a writer, and he has all the time in the world now to dwell on his thoughts. If only Estelle and Inez could agree to shut the fuck up. Of course, Garçon doesn't get his wish. Inez spends her time trying to seduce Estelle, and Estelle responds by rejecting her and trying to seduce Garçon, who wants nothing to do with her. And it is quite clear that Garçon and Inez want nothing to do with each other. I showed at the beginning of the video the iconic Hell is Other People moment, but there's a scene I believe to be even more impactful, the one that comes right before. Garçon begins desperately banging on the door to be let out. He can't take it anymore. The door is open. The guilt of accepting what he's done to his wife, accepting that he's actually not a hero, but a coward. Garçon pauses, saying he no longer wants to leave because of Inez. Because of me, she asks, genuinely confused. You anyhow know what it means to be a coward. Yes, I know. And you know what wickedness is, and shame, and fear. There were days when you peered into yourself, looked into the dark secret places of your heart, and what you saw there made you faint with horror. And then the next day you didn't know what to make of it. You couldn't interpret the horror you'd glimpsed the night before. Yes, you know what it costs to be evil. And when you say I'm a coward, you know from experience what that means. Isn't that so? Yes. So it's you I have to convince. You are of my kind. Garçon couldn't bear to leave Hell believing Inez had a poor opinion of him as a human subject. Garçon, I don't know why I keep calling him Garçon. I think his name is pronounced Garcin, but I'm just going to keep going with the French version Garçon. So Garçon wants to stay because Inez understands cowardice, but maybe he is also hopeful he can change her mind if only he can convince her he's not such a bad guy. Estelle wants Garçon to stay simply because he is a man, and any man will distract her from the horrific pain of what she did to unburden herself from responsibility. And while Inez is deeply repulsed by Garçon for most of the play, she admits she is greatly distracted simply by his being there. She can't ignore him, because if she did, she'd have to ignore her own pain and cruelty. Sartre wrote this in the 1940s. 
It's safe to say that under the conditions of late capitalism, this hell of self-consciousness we put on ourselves has only gotten more overwhelming. Human relations are still defined negatively and competitively, and the temptation to fall even further into passive consumption has proliferated with social media. Why create anything at all anymore when we can gain a sense of belonging by watching others do it in an echo chamber we already agree with using anti-capitalist rhetoric on TikTok? Oh, oh, this is a way to find my authentic selfhood. I've got to free myself from these conformists. So I'll be a non-conformist, I'll dress in black, I'll read Heidegger and Sartre, I'll listen to this different music, we'll all go out and be different together, and then pretty soon you've got a whole new industry selling dark clothes and, and weird funky music and coffee houses on every block because Americans can even market death. They can say, oh, you believe your life has no meaning unless you die, I can sell that to you. Or we can watch someone performatively thrive on Instagram by being reminded of how they are living their best life. And we, by being jealous lurkers on their page, are not. Comparison is the thief of joy, after all. Look, I get it. I'm one of those naive, social media is a moral and inhuman type of people. But I don't think it's as simple as that. I love social media. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't addicted to it. And it definitely isn't going anywhere. But if the goal to liberation, at least self-liberation, has to be through social media, then we have to understand how our conditions make us betray ourselves. It's easier to consume than to produce because it's easier to play the role of observer. But the reason it's way more difficult and therefore more rewarding to create is rather simple. Much more needs to be overcome within ourselves. And unfortunately, there is nothing comfortable about overcoming. As a content creator, I'm burdened with the responsibility of seeing myself only through the gaze of the other. It's like the story of Medusa's gaze, turning us into stone, petrifying except in a lot of cases we're our own Medusas, gazing into a mirror that reflects back and freezes us in time, telling ourselves that we can't do anything about it. And this doesn't happen in a bubble. This like alienation, human alienation, is a, an unnatural thing that's happened to humanity. It started when the economic incentive became more and more encompassing and it presented itself as this great challenge and now it isn't the challenge is also not just going out into the outside world and proving selling your yourself and your labor uh, i'm trying to make a youtube channel and being, be able to sustain myself financially while doing that, while simultaneously in real time right now, trying to get over my fear of how you will perceive me. But the truth is the you that perceives me is all made up, constructed in my head. Instagram, Twitter, I can use those as distractions to not do what needs to be done, which is do this video to alleviate the boredom and the intense loneliness or alienation, whatever you want to call it, I feel when I'm kind of just left to my own voice devices and trying to think. But trying to think, contemplation is itself a, a privilege that not everybody in this world, in this country, uh, get to do. And so I'm very grateful that despite my anxieties uh, about doing this and what every instinct in me right now is telling me, oh, just go on social media, see passively, see what other people are doing. Yet that that contributes further to the alienation because I'm really not doing what I want to do. There's a contradiction between wanting to be a free-thinking subject unburdened by the expectations of another and the desire to be validated among others as an interesting object. Because something that is universal to human thought, at least to me, is the desire for attention. 
and for that attention to be validating. But seeking out attention kind of means we're forced into a burden of responsibility to the other. Even among friends I trust, I have this deep insecurity that I'm always going to let them down by being a bad friend, whether that be by just not being there for them or by something as superficial as being perceived as boring. The band Birds and Row put it best in their song, Trump Loy. Quote, most of the times I feel lonely are when my friends are around, end quote. This is the problem between subjectivity and objectivity. When you're a subject, you create in your own head what the other is thinking of you. And since you're not the only person in this reality, that means that everyone else believes themselves to be their own autonomous subjects with their own desires. But in order to become a subject, we have no choice but to objectify other people. To make up a story in our heads about who that other is and how they think about us. But those thoughts are entirely self-reflexive and based on a story that we tell ourselves based on our admittedly limited perspective. And I think that is what is at the crux of Sartre's Hell is Other People. It's not necessarily that being around other people is hell, but that our material conditions have made it so we become harder and harder on ourselves by projecting our insecurities onto others, therefore placing an impossible expectation of ourselves onto other people. Sartre believed originally, when he was first writing about this in like the 1940s, was very cynical about humanity. Uh, it's kind of like, why would we create such hell on ourselves by projecting all of our deepest insecurities and fears, and fears onto other people, which then gets relayed back to us, because this is all in our own head, and makes it much more challenging for ourselves to interact with other people, because we've made it so much more exhausting on ourselves. It's self-inflicted, it's self-flagellating. It has everything to do with like all the guilt and shame we feel as individual subjects. Later on in Sartre's, like near the end of his life, when he became a Marxist, he started to realize that this condition wasn't natural to humanity, that this was something that developed as the economic structures to, to survive, to work to survive, you had to be around uh, other people. And this has only gotten more and more challenging now. Like this, this is our stealth boy. And all the, you know, all of the, what's the word I'm looking for? The just choose to passively consume instead of creating ourselves. Because we project our our guilt, our shame, our anguish, our despair onto the other, which gets reflected back into us, we choose, we, we potentially choose, and this is, this is the bad ending, we choose as humans not to interact because the burden of responsibility is just too much. There's too much that can go wrong, we, and then we risk being further humiliated, which further contributes to our our lack of our, our non-action humans need meaning in their lives in order to create it's exhausting and introverts are especially prone to this because we tell ourselves a story that being around other people saps us of our strength and while that may be true the alienation that is felt in choosing isolation feels even more painful because it is a choice we've made with our freedom to do so the oppression we feel, the pressure to conform to what we think is expected of us, remains a myth that holds us back from our potential as creative and responsible people. It's not that we have anxiety because others are in fact watching us, but rather the self-inflicted anxiety we place on ourselves of what others might be thinking of us. And in turn, other people do the same thing to us. It's a negative feedback loop, and a deeply tragic one. This may all sound very dark and hopeless, but... I'm trying to show here that once we acknowledge the hopelessness, we can begin to understand that what has happened to us isn't irreversible. The night can have a legitimate reason to be hyper aware around other people. After you agree to help the doctor find a cure to the Nightkin's schizophrenia, Marcus notifies you that the NCR have arrived unannounced to take over Jacobstown. 
They're being openly violent without opening a line of communication, killing bighorners, which is Jacobstown's primary means of trade. And the justification as to why the NCR are coming in to colonize Jacobstown is a story planted by the NCR that the super mutants of Jacobstown are responsible for killing bighorners in surrounding areas, which just isn't true. But it's convenient, since the NCR can spin this story due to humans' internalized suspicion of the super mutants, especially with the perceived unpredictability of the Nightkin. And since the NCR are racist towards mutants, it's up to you as the only human around to try to convince them to leave. Good thing we arrived when we did. You could choose to either talk to them diplomatically, bribe them to leave using Jacobstown's treasury fund, or outright kill them. I opted to talk since I put a lot of points into speech, which I always recommend if you plan on playing New Vegas as non-violently as you can. There's too much focus on killing in games anyhow. Come on guys, can we stop spending all this money on these banal experiences that really haven't changed that much in the past two decades? Anyway, convincing the NCR to leave via speech check is the most moral option because Jacobstown needs all the funding it can get. But New Vegas gives you options. Dark options. You can lie to Marcus and say the NCR's asking price to leave is more than it actually is, allowing you to pocket the money. Hell, you could even take all that money, kill the NCR, still pocket it all, and lie to Marcus. Turns out the slaughtering of Bighorners is a big problem for Jacobstown as well as the surrounding areas, as your main goal while in town is to investigate who or what is responsible for killing them. While the NCR overtly admit to irresponsibly killing some of them, the full truth is that a pack of wild Night Stalkers have been able to do it unnoticed because they've somehow gotten their claws on Stealth Boys. How a pack of wild animals were able to figure this out is quite clever and resourceful. There's one final ethical choice at the end of our time in Jacobstown. We could choose to experiment on Lily, using her as a guinea pig in order to save the rest of the Nightkin. We could take the moral high ground and choose not to experiment on her, but at the risk of not having enough data to help the Nightkin. Or we can pass an extremely difficult science check that I don't have that allows the good doctor to experiment on Night Stalkers instead of Lily, because apparently Night Stalkers and Super Mutants have similar genetic makeup. I'm not entirely sure how that works. But lacking this option, I choose to experiment on Lily, making my life easier because now she has super self bullying invisibility in order to save the wasteland from the fascists, but at the cost of her dementia getting even worse. But she agrees to help, so that makes my ego feel better. This moral dilemma reminds me of Sartre's example of the French soldier who has to choose between fighting for his country or stay home with his ailing mother, who would die without him. This isn't a rational choice, but it is a choice, one that he is burdened with with his freedom to do so. But where does that leave us? Because there is no scientific cure coming to cure our alienation. And Sartre's famous quote was that existence precedes essence. So if that's true, that means that as a human subject, you always have a choice. And... Not making a choice, living an inert, passive life where you just get swallowed more and more into the maelstrom prevents you from doing, from creating whatever and how, whatever way that might mean to you, whether that's going outside and gardening, whether that's cooking a meal, whether that's writing a YouTube video. Ma not making a choice is a choice, unfortunately. And Kierkegaard would call it, anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. It is up to us, despite the reality that it's becoming more and more challenging, as we become more introverted, as more people are working from home, as there are more opportunities to kind of not deal in the 3D matrix world, whatever you want to call it, tangible reality outside I don't even know what I'm saying now. The mutants had, the Nightkin especially, had two choices. They could either stay in Jacobstown, be passive, be among community, but kind of just passively wait for a cure, or they could go out, out of Jacobstown into the Mojave Wasteland, sustain their addiction. The, the passive option in their case 
was ironically the probably the better one because it was a less it led to it wasn't going to lead to more violence in our case passivity seems to be the more violent reality to ourselves and i don't know how to overcome that sartre didn't know to overcome it because we cannot help as humans to objectify others in order to affirm our very own subjectivity which makes us extremely alienated and getting to the point now where we don't even want to do anything around other people that's hell is other people but he thought that this could be overcome and that remains to be seen and that remains to be seen how it looks so I leave you guys with this in the comments. What might, uh, under our intensely digitized and hyper self-aware reality that we currently live in in 2024, what might community look like in the ways that we can overcome this self-reflexivity where we are ultimately objectifying other people, but at the cost of our own autonomy and ability to create Thanks for watching.